As I stood by the tomb of Cyrus the Great at Pasar Gadei in Iran, I was reminded of an amazing prophecy. Two centuries before his birth, the prophet Isaiah mentions his name. This is the man that was instrumental in emancipating the exiles and send them back to Jerusalem. Listen to the greatest ruler of antiquity, the man who was known as the builder of the greatest empire of his day. You're looking at one of the original bricks from Nebuchadnezzar's southern palace. This was a restoration from Saddam Hussein. This cuneiform writing says that Nebuchadnezzar was the great architect and builder of Babylon. But this is all that's left, just the account of its former luster. Why did this mighty empire pass away? Let me tell you this amazing story. After the conversion and death of Nebuchadnezzar in 562 BC, the Babylonian kings became weaker and weaker and at the same time more cruel. The last great king, Nabuchodonosor, left Babylon to his son Belshazzar, while he himself lived in Timon in Arabia, where he worshipped the moon god called Sin. Belshazzar gave a party on the night of October 12, 539 BC, in the banquet hall of the palace, and he invited a thousand of his nobles. Besides the luxurious food, they also had wine, women and song. While this party was going on, the Medo-Persian Empire surrounded the city. But the king couldn't care less. The reason? He thought his city was impregnable. He trusted in human accomplishments for his safety. The inner and outer walls totaled 25 meters of protection. While they drank from the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar brought from the temple in Jerusalem, a strange writing appeared on the plastered wall. The Bible says it was near the candlestick that the following words appeared, Mini Mini Tekel Yufarsen. No one was able to decipher the glowing words left by the bloodless hand. Finally, Daniel was called in and he translated the following. Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the balances and found wanting. Peres, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. The fall of Babylon is a very sad story. God allowed them to punish Judah for their sins of disobedience and cruelty. But through the years they've overstepped their task and they became very cruel and very oppressive. But Babylon was unwilling to repent. In sadness the prophet cries out. Jeremiah 51 verse 9 We would have healed Babylon, but she cannot be healed. The same is said of the mystical Babylon in the book of Revelations. Chapter 2 verse 21 I have given her time to repent of her immorality but she is unwilling. Through Daniel and his three friends, God tried to reach the Babylonians with his converting love, but they refused it. How sad! How are you and I reacting to God's intervention in our lives? But history tells us that one good thing came out of the Babylonian captivity. The Jews were permanently cured of idolatry. They started building synagogues and taught their children to obey the commandments of the Lord. It's very important to study the reasons why ancient Babylon came to its end in order to appreciate why God allows mystical Babylon of the book of Revelation to come to its end. 200 years before the birth of Cyrus, the prophet Isaiah predicted the manner in which he would conquer that city. Let's read about it. Isaiah 44 verse 27 and 28 Who says to the watery deep, a reference to the Euphrates River, Be dry, and I will dry up your streams. Who says to Cyrus, two centuries before his birth, He is my shepherd, and will accomplish all that I please. 
He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. You are looking at a scale model of the ancient city of Babylon and its museum at the site. The prophet Isaiah predicted that the waters of the Euphrates River would dry up, and this is exactly what happened. The Medo-Persian army marched down the dry riverbed, which protected the city. But there was one obstacle. Huge iron and copper gates next to the river protected Babylon. But listen to this amazing prophecy. Isaiah 45 verses 1 and 2. This is what the Lord says to his anointed. By the way, this title is also referring to Christ in Daniel chapter 9 verse 25 whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. A reference to the huge gates of ancient Babylon. History tells us that to the surprise of the Medo persian army, the huge gates that were supposed to protect the city were all unlocked. Could it be that the hand who wrote on the plaster of the wall dried up the river and unlocked the gates? I think so. Before telling you about the encounter between Daniel and Cyrus the Great, let me first give you a short biography of this great ruler. He became king of Anshan, a city north of the modern city of Shiraz, in 558 BC. He was ruling over the Persian tribes as a vassal prince of the Medes. After 558 BC, he united the various Persian tribes into one nation. Between 553 and 550, he conquered the Median Empire with its mighty capital, Ekbatana. Let me take you to the next kingdom that he conquered, that Cyrus the Great. You can still see some runes on top of that citadel. This is the citadel of Sardis. Croesus, king of Lydia, regarded his Lydian capital as impregnable. But one night, while he was asleep, Cyrus sent his troops up there and defeated the mighty and wealthy Croesus. Cyrus then transported his untold wealth from Sardis to the Median capital of Ekbatana, his former enemies. This was so typical of this great man. He treated his former enemies extremely well and allowed them to be the proud custodians of his wealth. He had a way of changing enemies into friends. When I visited the ruins of his former capital at Pasargade in Iran, I thought of what Hegel the German philosopher said about Cyrus, the architect of the Medo-Persian Empire. From a political point of view, Persia is the birthplace of the first true empire and perfect government made up of incongruous elements. As worshippers of light, Persians were tolerant towards other religions. Thus, the Persian way of government over other nations, both in religious and worldly affairs, was never accompanied by force. Archaeologists made some remarkable discoveries about the way Cyrus, the founder of the Archimedean Empire and his followers, ruled. Let me quote from Professor Heidemarie Koch. Most of our modern ideals about open, free and progressing societies were realized in the Archimedean civilization. What a testimony of human kindness coming from antiquity. You are looking at a message from Cyrus on his palace walls written in Babylonian, Persian and Elamite cuneiform. The Persians bestowed on him the title of Patriarch. The Greeks called him Lord and Legislator. The Jews entitled him Messiah of God. The Muslims gave him the title Zol Garnin, that means possessor of two centuries. This man transcended time and space. 
He was a righteous servant of God and the possessor of the first empire with a freedom charter. He was also the first king who struggled for the peaceful coexistence of diverse nations. What a man! Where do you and I fit into this picture? When you visit these earlier civilizations, you come across certain buildings that are called harem. The king's bedroom was too small to accommodate all his wives and concubines, so they had to build an extra building to house them. Cyrus the Great allowed his heart to only bestow love on one woman, and he remained true to her till the day of his death. What a man! What a challenge! Many of us can learn a lesson in this regard from Cyrus the Great. When I visited his tomb, I thought of his last message. O man, whoever thou art, and whence thou comest, for I know thou shalt come. I am Cyrus, who founded this vast kingdom for the Persians. Do not envy me this handful of dust which has sheltered me. Cyrus appreciated eternal values more than earthly wealth. He attached more value to peaceful coexistence than lording over people. He respected the beliefs of others while keeping his own firmly. He reigned over hearts besides reigning over territories. We are back at Babylon. What do you think happened when Cyrus met the prophet Daniel? Do you think Daniel would have discussed the new conqueror's role in prophecy? Yes, he did. Daniel testified to all the rulers he met about the faithful God he served. Cyrus, who was a monotheist worshipping Ahura Mazda, that's not the Mazda you're driving, stemming from Zoroaster, was pleasantly surprised when he discovered that Daniel was also a monotheist worshipping Yahweh. Josephus told us that Daniel told Cyrus that Isaiah had mentioned his name two centuries before his birth. He told Cyrus that according to the prophecy of this huge image, Medo-Persia represented the arms and chest of silver. After reading the following verse from the book of Isaiah, he was so impressed that he issued a decree permitting the Jews to return to their country. Isaiah 45 verse 13 I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free. But not for a price or reward, says the Lord Almighty. This is the melody of the gospel. What an amazing story, what a man. When the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart, he reacted in an obedient manner. No wonder the Jews called him the Messiah of God. You can compare the life of Cyrus with the life of Jesus who also sets the captives free and sends them to their heavenly Jerusalem. And what about the cost? Well, no cost involved. He already paid the price for our redemption at the cross of Calvary. I cannot tell you what it meant to me when I walked over the palace area where the greatest of all ancient rulers lived. On the Cyrus cylinder that archaeologists discovered, he wrote the following. I am Cyrus, king of the world, the great and just king, king of Babylon, king of Sumer and Akkad, king of the four corners of the world, son of Cambyses. When I stepped into Babylon as a friend, I ascended the throne amidst cheers of joy and pageantry in the governor's palace. My countless soldiers roamed Babylon in peace and sincerity. I forbade harassment and terror all over Sumer and Akkad. I strove for peace in Babylon and in all the other cities. I abolished forced labor in respect with the citizens of Babylon, which was against their social status. I helped restore destroyed houses. I accommodated them again with a peaceful place, ducks and doves. I tried to preserve their habitats. It's exciting to read how God used the Persian kings like Cyrus, Darius and Artaxerxes to assist his children in rebuilding their city. 
Eventually, both the temple and the city of Jerusalem were restored. During my visit at Persepolis, I told my child that often when a great leader dies, his posterity tends to be a little weaker. Cambyses, Darius, Xerxes and Artasasta, who took over the reins, were not of the same caliber as Cyrus the Great. I wish we had time to tell you about these Persian kings and how they related to God's people. Please make time and read the dynamic, spiritful books of Esther, Nehemiah and Ezra. History gives us the sad account of how the Persians started fighting the Greeks. They even set Athens alight. One of them even passed a death decree on God's people. The Book Prophets and Kings, page 502, tells us, The Medo-Persian realm was visited by the wrath of heaven because in it God's law had been trampled underfoot. The fear of the Lord had found no place in the hearts of the vast majority of the people. Wickedness, blasphemy and corruption prevailed. Let's go back to Daniel while he is interpreting the meaning of the dream of the metal image to the king. Daniel 2.39 After you another kingdom will rise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. When the great prophetic clock of Daniel 2 struck, Alexander the Great came on the scene of action. He first defeated Darius III at Granicus, near the Dardanelles. Next, he defeated him at Issus in 333 BC. And the last decisive battle occurred at Irbil in Iraq in 331 BC. Some historians believe that Alexander the Great destroyed Persepolis in retaliation because the Medo-Persians burned Athens. According to the prophecy of Daniel, the Greek Empire was to be succeeded by a fourth kingdom of iron. Let's read about it. Daniel 2 verse 40 Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. What an interesting description of the Roman Empire. Listen to what Edward Gibbons said. The images of gold or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successfully broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. This comes from the history and the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, volume 3, page 643. The Roman Empire ruled the world from 168 BC to 476 AD. Quite a long stretch of time. And during this time, the greatest event in human history took place. What was it? Matthew 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. From now on the prophecy becomes very exciting. Let's ask Daniel to tell us more about the next great historic event. Verse 41 Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. Verse 42 As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. What would you say is the meaning of clay in this prophecy? Jeremiah gives us the answer. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel, Jeremiah 18, verse 6. Daniel sees a strong human component in the disintegrated Roman Empire. He does not tell us whether this is a good or a bad human element. We will have to go to chapter 7 to look for something human among all the beasts of prey. The prophet sees a little horn emerging among the ten. Listen to its human features. Verse 8. 
This horn has eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. This does not sound too good. We are listening to a cruel, persecuting voice, and a voice like that of ancient Babylon. Please don't miss the coming lectures when we will discuss the little horn in more detail. Because clay is so brittle, it needs the political steel to achieve its goals. Daniel sees an alliance between the state and the church in this vision. He sees a close cooperation between statecraft and churchcraft. He sees the time in which you and I are living right now. When we come to the sea beast of Revelation 13, we find this interesting continuation of a human element. Let me read it to you. Revelation 13.18 This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast. For it is a man's number. His number is 666. This unique number is the number of a man. We want to know who is this man. Could it be that this beast, the little horn of Daniel 7, and the feet of clay represent the same persecuting power? Yes, it does. Let us return to Babylon where Daniel interprets the meaning of the king's dream. The Roman Empire finally disintegrated in 476 AD. And then the kingdom split up into the European nations as we know them today. We want to know from Daniel what is going to happen to the divided Europe. We also want to know from him what is going to happen to the rest of the world. Verse 43 and just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united, any more than iron mixes with clay. Now this is very plain. Europe will never be united. Historians tell us that Charlemagne was the first man who tried to unite Europe. He failed because the prophecy of Daniel said it would never happen. As you enter St. Peter's in Rome, you notice this red marble spot. The Pope was in the process of crowning Charlemagne as the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire when he grabbed the crown from the Pope and crowned himself. Voltaire refers to this interesting incident by saying, Neither Emperor, neither Holy, neither Roman. Prophecy said that Europe would never be united, and neither Pope nor Emperor succeeded. Napoleon said in 1811, Within five years I will be the ruler of the world. Have you listened to Tchaikovsky's 1812 symphony? It depicts Napoleon's defeat in Russia. In prison, Napoleon is reported to have said, I try to found a European system, a European code of laws, a European court of appeals. There would have been but one people throughout Europe. Europe would soon have become one nation. This comes from the publication The Watchman, August 1941. You can visit the home where Kaiser Wilhelm died in exile in Holland. He wanted to unite Europe, but the prophecy of Daniel 2.43 prevented him. After World War I, Winston Churchill said, There was a deep conviction and almost universal hope that peace would reign in the world. But Hitler shattered that dream when he invaded Poland in 1938. He tried, like all his predecessors, to unite Europe, but he failed. And so too will the European Union fail. Why? Because we have the sure word of prophecy which says, Daniel 2.44 In the time of those kings, that's plural, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Daniel looks down the stream of time and he sees our day. He sees our misery. He sees our sorrow. He listens to lonely prayers of broken, hurting fathers, 
mothers, children and singles. He sees the trauma of both literal and symbolic funerals. But then he also sees a rock that strikes the image of this sinful polluted world and replaces it with a pure kingdom of righteousness, a kingdom populated with kind people. Jesus referred to himself as the rock of Daniel 2 and he says in Luke 20 verse 18 Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Jesus the rock has power to break my callous, rebellious and unkind heart into small pieces of kindness if I fall on him, if I yield myself to him but he also possesses power to crush me and remove me from his future kingdom of righteousness if I choose to remain an unkind rebel. A confrontation with the rock is unavoidable. You and the rock will connect. The kind of confrontation is up to you. Let me read you my favorite verse on what heaven is going to be like. Revelation 21 verse 4 and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. This huge television tower in former East Berlin was constructed during the time of the communist rule. To their dismay, after its completion, a cross appeared on this huge ball. The atheists were horrified and ordered the resurfacing of the tower to erase the cross. The job was done and now they were waiting for the sun to make its appearance. And then one day after many weeks of grey skies, the sun pushed its rays through the clouds onto the tower. And guess what? The cross shone in even greater glory. You cannot erase the message of the cross. It is a message of hope that invites us to become part of God's kingdom of happiness. The cross conveys a message that Jesus Christ cleanses repentant sinners of all their guilt and stain. Every time I visit Berlin and this tower, I appreciate the message of the cross just a little more. It tells me that God's love is persistent. It tells me that he will never give up on me as long as I live. The cross invites me to spend a little more time beholding the kind and selfish and loving character of Christ. The more I look, the more I change into a kind, loving and considerate person. May the message of the cross help you and me to prepare for God's soon coming. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are interested in each and every person and that your love reaches everyone. Please show us what your plan for our lives is and guide us as we follow your plan. Amen. After Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about the great image, Daniel also had a similar interesting dream. He saw four beasts emerging from the sea. What was the meaning of this dream? Don't miss the next presentation.